Good morning again, um, I'm Pavel. Um, today I have one hour and 15 minutes to talk about uh, refinement tools in Phoenix for Chromium. And also I will touch on some of the aspects of validation. I'm not going to talk about it at length, given that Jane is going to talk about it towards the end of the workshop. Okay, you've seen the slide already. Um, so in Phoenix, we have pretty much complete pipeline to go from um, a starting map through the reconstruction all the way down to refinement and I mean, build model that you can define and validate and, and publish. So the scope of this talk is refinement and validation. Now, um, what is refinement? Uh, very, very broadly, refinement is basically a procedure that uh, given a map and approximately placed model into that map allows you to fit that model into the map as good as possible and also maintain appropriate chemistry of the model. So this is really in a nutshell what refinement is. We'll go into uh, greater details in a moment. Now, just so you know, and sometimes these are confused with refinement. So there are several scenarios for model to map fitting, which are docking, flexible fitting, morphing, and refinement. So um, all this, all these scenarios basically aim at fitting the model into the map, but the starting points are different, and that's what makes the difference between all of them. All right, so docking is when you have a map and you happen to have a model already, probably from a previous experiment, crystallography, for example, and you want to, to place that approximate model into the map. So the map and model can be very, very far away in space and you just want to rigid body place, fit the model into the map. So that's talking. Flexible fitting is when you have model already placed into the map, but not very accurately. So there are still um, pieces of the model that can, that can fit better and that to do so, they would need a lot of movement so that's where the flexible fitting is useful. And final refinement is when the model is, is in the map and fit in the map pretty much well, and you just want to fine tune the model so it fits even better. So that's, that's the refinement. So the difference between the three is what we call conversion status, is by how much you expect the model to move to fit the map. Okay. Um, now, in terms of tools in Phoenix to do refinement, um, we have two major programs, Phoenix Refine and Phoenix Real Space Refine. Phoenix Refine is to do refinement um, using crystallographic data, diffraction intensities, amplitudes, and Phoenix Real Space Refine is to do the same, but using uh, CRIAM data, the map. But conceptually, all these two tools are very, very similar in terms of underlying tools that we use. So we start out with initial model, experimental data, be that map or crystallographic data. We use some a priori knowledge that I'll mention, and Nidal will talk about it, which we call restraints. And we use some score function to, to make sure we move model into the data as good as possible. And in the end, you get hopefully improved model, atomic model. That's what refinement is, and that's the two tools that we have in Phoenix. They are both available in the GUI, and towards the end, I will run some demonstrations, so we'll see uh, them in action. One of them, real space refinement. Now, um, I don't really have a lot of time to go through all the details, but we have a paper published 
that describes basics about real space refinement in Phoenix. So published about two years ago. So if you really want to go into great details and learn how things work, you can check out this paper. But the basic highlights of real space refinement in Phoenix, um, we don't use Fourier space to, to operate. There's no structure factors as a result. We don't calculate R factors to measure goodness of fit. And again, model, refined model is directly fit into the map. So that's, <clears throat> that's the essence of the procedure. Now I realize some of you, or probably many of you, used to do crystallography and now doing cryom. So it may be a good idea to kind of counterpart crystallography versus cryom refinement. What are the similarities? What are the differences? And why it's important when we talk about refinement. So in, <clears throat> in crystallographic refinement, when you improve the model, that improves the map. And maps you look at, typically two maps, two F-Ox minus f calc and f minus f calc difference map. Both these maps are always use, always use a model phase. So you can calculate and see them. Therefore, they're all model biased by, by definition. And that has a number of consequences. So one is better the model, it's better the map, right? And once you get a better map, you can build more model. And that's kind of a circular argument here. Also that means by improving model in one place, you can actually improve the map elsewhere and you can build even more model. And that also means you really need to refine all parameters from start to end because everything contributes to everything in refinement in reciprocal space in, in, in case of crystallography. Also, when it comes to solvent, it's also a good idea in crystallography to build, build it early because that may help improve phases and improved phases leads to better maps and better maps lead to better models. So the other fact is in crystallography experimental data, pretty much never changes. Once you got your FOPs, it's best you never touch them, you never massage, and never do anything to this FOPs. Um, the weight in, in refinement we optimize a certain target, and the target is a composite of data term and restraints, and there is a weight factor between the two to balance them. So um, it's a big deal in, in, in refinement because by choosing this weight, you can put more emphasis on the experimental data or on restraints. And finding that weight optimally in crystallography may take a lot of time because you need to try a lot of refinements, a lot of weights, and see which one produces the best result. All right. Um, and that also the fact that uh, all atoms contribute to all structure factors, you need to refine the whole structure all the time, pretty much. Now, things are a bit different in, in cryom. And one fundamental fact is changing atomic model does not change the map. So for model building and refinement, that has at least two implications. So you don't really want to build solvent in the very beginning, so you build it literally the last step because that's not going to change your, your map and interpretation. Um, you don't refine all the parameters all the time. So first you need to place your model into the map as good as possible so you refine coordinates most of the time until the end. And then once you get the most accurate model placed in the map, you refine B factors. Second fact is uh, that experimental data, and to that I refer the crime reconstruction map, can actually change a lot during the process. So you may extract boxes, you may do filtering, you may want to blur it or sharpen it and go back and forth. So you keep changing, so the, the data is in fact is kind of a moving target. It's essentially the same, but it, it, may, it may change in, in different ways. What that means for refinement is, well, you want to ask 
may, may want to ask a question what map to use in refinement. There's no consensus on this, but probably the best possible map you have. And when it comes to refining B factors, what map you want to use to refine B factors? And for example, why it matters is because if you use sharpened map to refine B factors, then you get all B factors are unrealistically small. It doesn't make sense. Right, so this is something to think about, this, this kind of aspects. Now, the, the restraints that I mentioned in, in, in crystallographic case, in, in cryam, they can be calculated very easily and quickly and find optimal all the time because things are local. That's very important aspect. So there's not a problem in crystal and in cryam. And also, you don't have to refine the entire structure all the time. You can focus on particular parts of it. And that may speed up process quite importantly. Now, I'm going to spend two slides on very technical detail, but it's very important for understanding for those who, you know, who, who wants to understand um, deeper how things work. So I'm going to talk about refinement target used in, in, in real space refinement, in Phoenix real space refine. So most of the time when you think of fitting atomic model to the map, you can you think of either cross correlation or least squares target function. So both functions basically trying to relate model calculated map to experimental map as good as possible. So these targets are quite accurate. They allow to match shapes of model calculated map against the experimental map but they are very slow to calculate. And it turns out they're virtually impractical for extra huge structures. This is why these targets are not used in real space refinement. What is used in, space, in real space refinement in Phoenix is what we call atom center target. It's very simple. It's basically interpolate uh, experimental map density at atom centers, sum them up, it's the sum of all atoms multiplies it by one, and that's the target. So an intuitive understanding of this target, the way it works, is basically it tries to move atoms to nearest density peaks. So this target function doesn't care about density of shapes. Therefore, it's less accurate. And the implication for refinement is that refinement heavily relies on geometry restraints. It needs restraints to maintain your model geometry as correct as possible. And most importantly, this is very quick to calculate. So it's at least order of magnitude faster than cross correlation or least squares target function. And that's why real space refinement in, in Phoenix literally can be done for very large models or even on a laptop. So it's very fast to calculate, but there is a cost for this, right? It's less accurate. And just to illustrate why it's less accurate again, um, so let's just consider this very simple toy example where you have high resolution case and two dimensional distribution of electron densities and two atoms sitting nearby. So what this refinement target function is going to do here is going to move these atoms into these peaks just by design of this function, right? So that's all right in high resolution, but at low resolution, you really don't have individual atoms resolved in the map. So you have blobs of density. So in low resolution, in this particular example, per example, you just have one peak. And the, this kind of target function really would try to move these two atoms into this one peak, resulting in a clash. So, that's never happens in reality when you run refinements because again, we use a lot of geometry restraints to prevent this from happening. Okay, hope that makes sense. And moving on, um, this is what uh, the workflow of real space refinement looks like. So that's to start with some input map and model end up with the fine model and that's the number of things that happen during refinement. So um, 
not everything what is listed here actually happens when you run it in space refinement by default, but only rotomy fitting, B factory refinement, coordinates minimization, and weight calculation. That all happens when every time we run refinement with all the default parameters. So rotomy fitting is basically just going through side chain from side chain to side chain and making sure that they fit map as good as possible and not throwing my outliers and such. Uh, B factor refinement, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but it happens every time you run real space refinement. And I mentioned weight calculation between restraints and um, data terms, always calculated optimally as part of refinement run. So if you come from crystallography, you know that's a problem. It's not a problem in cryo-M case. Now, there are a few more things here. So, morphing and simulated annealing um, are kind of tools for more aggressive, so let's say, refinement when you know your model doesn't fit map quite well and may need some quite important, quite, quite large movement to fit the map. And these are tools to basically explore space more broadly and that's why they don't actually happen by default because not always you start with a model that poorly fits the map it's your user decision whether you want to use this as part of refinement or not and model idealization is another flavor of sort of the same concept when may happen and i see it all the time um, input model geometry may not be very good it may you know just this is just an illustration so for example any you know you have, have helices in your structure that are quite distorted and for example like this and if this is something you start out in the fi your refinement with then refinement may not converge to a correct helix geometry just because refinement mathematically is a local optimization problem so um this tool model idealization that Alex Sabalov uh, works in our team on is basically a way to kind of precondition your structure. So it goes from very distorted to kind of better geometrically, and that turns out to be a better starting point for, for refinement. Again, that's not always the case, and that's not that's why that doesn't happen by default when you run real space refinement. But keep in mind you can do it. Now, restraints, restraints are very important. I mentioned this a couple of slides ago. Why? Because we use very simplistic refinement target function, which is fast, but the price is, it really needs a lot of restraints to, to work. And this is just a toy example to entertain you, to prove my, kind of illustrate my point about the importance of restraints. All right, so this is a toy example where we have a sausage of low resolution density where we place a, an ideal alpha helix. And if you just use standard restraints on covalent geometry, such as bonds and angles, angle restraints and repulsions, for example, you know, the helix atoms are going to move to fit the density as good as possible. That's what the farming target wants it to do. But Obviously, the geometry of this is going to be very distorted. So it's not helix anymore. It doesn't, the result doesn't really make chemical sense. Why? It's because we didn't tell the procedure that this is a alpha helix. So the point, the lesson from, from this exercise is we need to use as much information as possible to help refinement to produce meaningful results. And that, that happened by means of restraints that we use. So we try to use as much as possible restraints in refinement. Not only restraints on covalent geometry, but also restraints on side chain distributions. We use rotomer restraints, we use Roma channel plot restraints. Very controversial topic, I'll talk about it in a minute. We use secondary structure restraints, we use internal symmetry, 
in crystallography it's NCS restraints, non crystallographic symmetry restraints. In cryon is your molecule symmetry that we try to explore in, in refinement. Reference model restraints, if you happen, if you know that the structure you work on has a similar structure already deposited, published elsewhere, and it's a better quality, higher resolution structure, you can actually use that structure to help refinement to produce a better model in the end. So all these restraints are possible to use in Phoenix Real Space Refine. Now I'll mention briefly um, internal symmetry restraints or NCS restraints. And what that is, well, that, 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 that comes into play when your molecule has a number of similar or identical subunits, chains, right? So, and depending on the resolution, you may treat this chain as identical or similar, and definitely that's kind of extra information you know about your molecule. The fact that your chains are similar, identical, and related by some, some operators. So you may want to use this information in refinement. Uh, it's important to realize how you use this. There are two ways, there are two concepts, constraints versus restraints. And these are two very frequently confused and mixed. So let's make it straight. So constraints basically require that all related symmetry related copies are identical. So refinement will force all copies to be identical if you use NCS constraints. Restraints, it's very similar, except that um, it requires, they require that copies are similar, but not necessarily identical. So that's the difference between constraints and restraints. Currently, uh, Phoenix Real Space Refine only uses NCS constraints. That's the current limitation, if you want. So we're working on actually getting restraints available as part of Real Space Refine procedure. Now, I have several slides to kind of summarize common questions and basic ideas about, um, about Real Space Refine. Phoenix. So this is really not in uh, any logical order, but just a collection of facts based on what people ask most of the time and why English and privately. Okay, so um, well, basically running with all the holes is okay in most cases. So most of the time, you don't really need to change anything. You just give, give the procedure model, map, and resolution, and that should be fine most of the time. So now, uh, map resolution doesn't, is not really used in refinement per se, but it's it only used to calculate cross-correlation value to report it for, for you for your information. So it doesn't affect the final result, doesn't affect the defined structure. So that's just be to realize, you don't have to be creating the accurate number for refinement, it's not going to change anything. Um, when do I need to adjust refinement settings? Most of the time you don't, but science you do need to do this is when you realize something isn't right with your refined model or with model to, to map feed. For example, you get a lot of various sort of outliers or you get low correlation or there's something abnormal that you believe happening in refinement, and that's the point to think what, what I can tweak in refinement to, to help. Or you know from the start your, more, your, map doesn't, your, your model doesn't fit map very well, you know parts of the model that need a lot of movement to fit the map, so in those cases you may enable morphing, simulate annealing, or you know your structure is pretty distorted to start with, so you may want to idealize it prior to going to refinement. So resolutions like 3, 3.5 and lower are very typical for cryom. So again, remember restraints are important. So it's important to use extra information 
as, as you can. Roma channel port restraints, secondary structure restraints, reference model restraints, if available. That's important. Now, uh, just a few facts about internal symmetry and CS restraints. So, how you, how, you, how you set this up, how we define secondary uh, NCS restraints. Well, there's a tool in Phoenix GU and as well as in command line called Phoenix Simple NCS from PDB, where you just give it a model that will come up with partitioning of the structure by the symmetry. You can specify it manually. You can write a Phoenix uh, parameter file where you define this. It's all described in the documentation. Very important to keep in mind that um, this automatic determination of NCS copies relies very heavily on model quality. So if you give a poor model, don't expect poor NCS annotation. So it's always a good idea to check this annotation manually. Now, um, it's quite often that maps are symmetrized, that symmetry was implied during uh, three-dimensional reconstruction. So in those cases, you always want to use NCS constraints because symmetry-related bits of the map are identical. And that means there's no point to believe that models in those symmetry-related places in space should be different. So you want those models these chains to be identical, right? Uh, if symmetry was not used in reconstruction, then we go by resolution. So at high resolution, well, I'd say 2.2, 2.5 and better, we don't want to use NCS because there may be real differences between symmetry copies. And at low resolution, three maybe, four and lower, we want to use either NCS restraints or constraints. And again, currently Phoenix will specify and use, um, use constraints only. Um, secondary structure restraints, that's another class of restraints that are very important to use when needed. So we basically always want to use it at reaction resolution or worse. If you have a data map Better than reaction resolution, you, you, it's case dependent, you use it as needed. If you have geometry violations that are consistent, you fix the model and they come back, then it's probably a sign to use secondary structure restraints. Again, very much like uh, NCS, secondary structure equation. So you need to look at the structure and tell what are the helices, what are the shits, and, and so on. And very importantly, secondary structure notation, if you choose to use it, must be as complete and accurate as possible because any errors that happen to occur in, in secondary structure notation will be propagated into your refined model by the use of restraints. So that's very important. Now, a few more facts about uh, secondary structure notation. So the information about secondary structures, I'm sure you all, in, you all know, it's kept in, uh, and recorded in uh, Helix and Sheet Records or PDB file or whatever the equivalent is in MMCIF, or it can be supplied as Phoenix parameter files. So tools to create secondary structure notation, you can do it manually if you wish, but for large structures could be a tedious exercise. So um, there's a command line tool in Phoenix called secondary structure restraints. You get a model, uh, it will produce Phoenix parameter file with secondary structure notation. Or there is a graphical user interface tool to do this for you. Now, again, importantly, quality of secondary structure notation is important because any errors, again, will propagate into refined model. The quality of annotation depends on quality of input model. So garbage in, garbage out. If you give it a poor, geometrically poor structure, don't expect 100% correct secondary structure annotation. Another fact is no software out there can annotate secondary structure fully reliably and fully correctly. So there's always need to go manually over the annotation and validate it. And again, manual validation is almost required. That's what I said. So that's important. 
Now, moving on, let's talk about rheumatoid channel block restraints. So we do use them at resolutions about three action wars. At higher resolutions, we use them as needed. For example, to preserve originally good model from deterioration due to any reasons like map imperfections or whatnot. It's a good idea to check Rama channel plot regularly. Don't just look at one number of Rama channel plot outliers or two numbers, favorites and such. To look at Rama channel plot, Phoenix Define, Phoenix Real Space Define, and Phoenix Define as well. In the GUI, they always create these plots for you. So check them regularly. That's important. And also, even more important, don't use Rama channel plot restraints to fix Roma channel plot outliers. That's a bad idea. Fix outliers first manually and then use the restraints to stop them from reoccurring if they do. All right. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about it in the next slides. So basically, that's what I just said. Don't fix outliers using Roma channel plot restraints. And if you do do this, that's what potentially can happen. And this is something you don't really want to happen. So this is a real example of 5A9Z from PDB that has a lot of outliers from the channel plot outliers. And if you choose a laser, uh, lazy option and say, I don't want to do manually, just run real space refinement, turn on all the Rama channel plot restraints and hope for the best. That's what's going to happen. Try it myself. That's, that's what I get. Um, and this is something you don't really want to get because really plots look very unnaturally and most of the time, and I'll explain why, why, why this is not really great, but um, take home message, you don't want to do this. Really the scenario when you want to do this is, is here. So if you start out with a good model that has all the residues in correct verified origins and you run refinement and this is something to get out of refinement because you know map, map may not be um, detailed enough to to keep all the all the chemistry correct so that's the case for you to go back start with this model turn on rama channel plot restraints so you don't get something like this so that's the valid use of restraints from a channel plot restraints. Okay, so towards the end of your structure refinement, real, in real space, try on case, um, as I mentioned, you don't need to refine the factors all the way. So you do it really as a final, pretty much final step. So um, this is a matter of fact, and that's the current limitation of real space refined. So it's all, it defines only group B factors, one B factor per residue, one or two B factors per residue, you can remember exactly. So that's not, that, this is not individual B factor refinement. So, and that happens all the time when you run refinement, but you may want to disable it for your routine runs until the very end. Now, very recent addition to, to Phoenix, and also this is something you do towards the end, is water picking. So now there's a Phoenix tool called Phoenix Dose and um, it's available in the graphical user interface. That's the tool. If you happen to have a high resolution cryo map and actually can see water, water molecules, water, water picks, you can use this tool to build solvent water automatically. And it tries to be smart. So it uses hydrogen bond networks to decide whether the water makes sense. Now in cryam to build water is more difficult than in crystallography because in crystallography, we know the map scale. So, you know, in F ops minus F calc map, you look at three sigma at in two F ops minus F calc map, you look at one sigma or so. In cryam, it could be anything, so it's very difficult, but the procedure knows how to find the, the reliable, the optimal peak strengths so that you can still interpret it in atomic model. So there's automatic machinery that 
kind of can learn what are the peak heights that are typical for this map that makes sense to interpret. It can build multiple solvation shells, not just one molecule, one water that is related to protein, but it can go onwards and build, um, build more. It tries to be smart about not placing waters where they don't belong to, like if you have misfit side chains or main chains, there's a good strong peaks to place water, but water doesn't belong here. So there's a machinery to avoid this. It's still experimental feature. So give it a try. Let me know if it doesn't do what you want and I'll try to improve it. Okay, now let's quickly talk about validation before I run tutorial. So um, again, this is not comprehensive, not going to go into great details as human Jane will do. Um, but just to provide, give you highlights and focus on one feature that we recently published. Um, so what is validation? Validation is basically checking model data and how model fits the data. That's, the, that's, that's in a natural what it is. And a typical misconception to just Think of validation as looking at the model alone. No, you really need to do the data, look at the data, because it's important to know the quality of your data. It's important to, re to validate the data. Uh, and you really want to know how a model fits the data, and that's part of validation as well. Uh, why to do, it's pretty obvious statements, it saves time. If you know what to expect, you can be more efficient. To, helps to produce better models, sets correct expectations. So if you know your crystallographic data twinned, you know what to expect. If you know your prime map of six sanction resolution, again, you know what to expect. Minimizes mistakes and such. But um, a couple of years ago, we published kind of a state of the art summary uh, at that time about tools available for prime validation. And that's, that's very long reading, but you can find all the stuff there. Now, why to do is just a few examples where validation fails and structures actually end up being in, in the database. So this is one, 2015. You know, it's very high correlation to the map. So, you know, look at this number, you'll just say everything is all right. Um, but it turns out that there's a piece of the structure that has no density whatsoever. And this is something you don't want to have in published structure. Oh, well, something like this is still there. I, I've verified. <laughs> so um, model doesn't fit the map at all. So you download the model, download the map, and they don't match. Um, it's obviously origin shift issue, which is trivial. But as a user, database user, you can be very confused if you see your know, the model doesn't fit the map. Or well, something like this, which is very, very recent. A structure has just awful amount of uh, outliers of all kinds, very high class score, poor Ramachandran, lots of um, Rodema outlier, and, and so on. Again, it's just highlights of why validation is important and what happens when it fails. Now, uh, again, thinking and minding that some of you are crystallographers doing cryom or about to do cryom, let's see what our similarities and differences in when it comes to validation. So when you validate your model, it's literally identical cryom versus crystallography. Model doesn't care where it comes from. So you look at all the same model statistics. Data are obviously different. Here we're looking at diffraction intensities versus uh, three-dimensional reconstruction. So there are different tools to do data validation. And in Phoenix for crystallography, we have XGRs for crime, we have MGRs. Both tools are available in the command line and in the GUI. And model to data feed are similar, but not necessarily identical. So in crystallography, we calculate R factors to quantify how model fits the data. In CRIM, we use different sorts of correlation coefficients. But also in, in, in crystallography, we do use map to model correlation coefficients to see how model fits, fits the map. So there are similarities and differences here. 
Okay, so now I'm going to uh, talk about something that we just published last month, and this is mostly Oleg Sobolev work. Um, something to do with Ramachandran plot. Okay, so um, let me start with this fact, and the fact is that you progressively use validation metrics in refinement more and more often. So for example, Phoenix Refine and Real Space Refine, they use Ramachandran load restraints, C by the deviation restraints, secondary structure restraints, they use uh, Rotomer restraints as well. And all, the, all these tools used to be a very good validation tools, but as soon as they use and refinement, they become less capable of catching problems as validation tools, right? So they, they, they're not validation tools, they're not independent validators anymore as soon as they become refinement targets. So that's, that's, the, that's the global concern. Um, and I'll explain why and demonstrate in a second. So here's an example. A look at this example, that's again very recent structure. And if you look at what we look pretty much all the time when we do cycles of refinement, this is just a basic summary of model quality. Right, so um, the clash score, which is great. The Ramachana plot statistics is also fantastic. We do expect some outliers, so that's stuff within the limit. There's no random outliers, no some better deviations resolution at this resolution. So it looks pretty perfect statistics given the resolution. Now, if you plot the Ramachandran graph, then you'll immediately see that something is quite odd about, about um, something that's quite strange about this, this plot. So, everything is somehow very narrowly distributed around where you want them to distribute it, as well as there are some very, very strange artifacts that you would have a hard time to explain why that happens, right? So, um, you know, when we do refinements and do pipelines, how we catch these problems? So when you look at the plot, you kind of realize, and if, you know, if you have a trained eye, you can immediately see what is good or what is bad. Right, so the previous plot kind of looks odd to, to try and eye. You know, in obvious case, this is a great plot. Everything, you know, where we expect it to be, follow distribution, it's fine. And you know what is poor. So these are obvious cases. But what if you have something like this, where, you know, everything is very, now, similar to previous case where everything is in um, in regions where you want them to be, but there's still something systematically off in each of these plots. You have counterings here, you have residues distributions shifted to the left of the peak, even, even more, you have artifacts here. So, if you look at global numbers, like number of outliers or percentage of in favorite region, these plots are all all right. But when you look at them, there's something odd. So how do you tell this? It turns out people published uh, a paper more than 20 years ago. And basically they describe a tool that allows you to calculate one single number that quantifies a Ramachandran plot. So that's called that score, Ramachandran plus that score. And there's a very simple rule, just one number, greater than three is poor, between two and three, suspicious, less than two, good. So very simple rule, very simple number to calculate. And that number lets you actually tell something about um, about plots, Roman channel plots, actually without looking at them. Again, I'm not advocating for not looking at Roman channel plots, 
but it's just a way to say something about your plot without actually plotting it. So in this example, the good plot would have very nice Rama Z score, poor plot will have obviously poor Z score. For these three examples where everything looks okay, but not quite, the Rama Z tells you immediately that things are not great here. So very poor Rama Z scores. That's a very nice numerical way to tell something about your Rama Chandran distribution. And for this particular example that I started with, Rama Z is minus 3.3, which, which makes it poor, and which you can see by yourself just looking at the plot. Right. Okay, so this is really recent work. This is implemented in, in Phoenix by Oleg Sobolev. This has been used in PDB Redo for ages, but they didn't really advertise that enough. So probably nobody knows about this tool. So we, we did our effort to, to actually bring it up and use in production um, and highlight its utility. So this paper came out, I think last month or two months ago. Okay, so I'm towards the end of my slides. And before I turn to, to tutorials, um, it's very important. So we talk about software and software may or may not work for you. There may be bugs, there might be features that are missing. So there are channels for you to communicate to us, different mailing lists, the Phoenix Bulletin Board, that's the public mailing list. You can report box and help lists that goes to Phoenix developers only. Now it's very important facts about uh, reporting bugs, or asking for help. So really we can't help you if you don't help us to understand your problem. So it's very important that you um, tell us as, as much details as possible about your question, your problem. If you just tell, I ran Phoenix real space, you find it crashed, we can't help you because we have no idea what happened. But if instead you send us input files, you explain what steps you did before it crashed, then we'll try to replicate the problem on our end and see how we can help you given what, what we see. So yes, that's the, the utility of bug reports and asking for help depends on you, how much information you provide, right? And whatever files you send us are treated totally confidentially. So we don't share them with anyone. Okay, with this, I finish my slides and I'm going to move to to demonstrations, but I'm, I'm happy to, to answer your questions. Okay, so um, I think there's been a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, um, uh, why, don't we, why don't we try to address some of them? Um, there was one that I, I think was too detailed for anybody to pick up here, but uh, I'll see if I can find it. Ooh, so many questions. Uh, there was a question about, yeah, in real space refine, Rotomer restraints in terms of sigma values seem to be titrated down from five in the first macro cycle to one in the final macro cycle. Is it possible to manually change this initial value, the sigma value? Um, yeah, at this point, it's really hardwired in the code, but, um, and this is, this is kind of strategy that I came up using in a lot of cases. So it's just not a, it's not arbitrary decision, but I'm very interested to look at particular example where it doesn't work quite well. So I can go ahead and, and adjust the settings or even provide, um, provide a possibility to, you know, use a specified values. And so, yeah, this is, this is something is, is right now you can't really change, but I can change it very quickly. And, but before I do this, I, I'd like to talk more a little bit, probably offline to see what's the real motivation to do this. Right. Um, and this wasn't a question, but it was a comment 
from Tristan saying that um, uh, just commenting that map 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 magnification can sometimes still be an issue, and he says that he's recently seen cryo EM maps that have been out by up to seven percent, which is a big number <laughs> uh, in terms uh, of magnification. Tristan, uh, Tristan uh, if you could share this map offline, uh, I'm, I'm still interested in looking into magnification, even though I tried very hard in the beginning to see how this can be handled in refinement. At this point, by this time, I'm already failed, but I'm still interested to pursue this, this issue. So if we could talk offline and look at particular examples, that would be great. Uh, Excuse me, are we allowed to ask questions or uh, you want them to be in the end? Um, no, no, uh, that's okay to ask questions, although we do have to try and get to the practical part of this too, so, but feel free. Okay, so uh, Paul, um, oh, sorry, not Paul, I forgot you, um, uh, Pavel. Mm. Uh, say if you have, if you had three maps of exactly the same protein at uh, three different resolutions, one which is quite high, let's say three angstrom, the other around five, and, a, and, and the other around seven. Uh, let's forget what it contains and just assume it's protein. <clears throat> uh, also see you're also confident of what you built at three angstrom. And you plan to use this model um, at, uh, which you obtained from this high resolution map as a reference model, sorry, as a reference model, initial model for all the other uh, maps at uh, five angstrom and Seven angstrom. So, what settings would you recommend for defining these at uh, these low resolution models at five and seven? Yeah, I mean, definitely five angstrom resolution refinement is challenging. And yes, if you by any chance have higher resolution structures that you can use that are similar and they, that you can use as reference restraints or reference structures for your low resolution refinement, that's definitely something you should use and you can use this in, in refinement in real space refinement. Yes, but uh, I mean, there are so many settings apart from uh, just a reference based uh, refinement, isn't it? You have lots of options like uh, atomic displacement parameters, global minimization, morphing, whatnot, whatnot, you know, secondary structures. So uh, I mean, I, I want to get down to that. You know, what options would you recommend apart from using the reference, uh, the uh, yeah, this model as a high resolution, uh, as a reference initial model? And what other options would you recommend in these resolutions, five and seven, let's say? Well, definitely Just, that that resolution. Yes, if you have any symmetry, you do use symmetry. You use all the restraints as I mentioned, like uh, secondary structure, because you, you can use you can use your high resolution structure. To annotate um, secondary structure, for example, it's more accurate structure, so you can definitely use that to build secondary structure restraints and use that structure as a reference for requirements. That's a good idea too. Then uh, you said morphing and simulated annealing. That depends. So if if your low resolution structure fits the map reasonably well, then you probably don't use don't want to use this kind of aggressive refinement strategies, but if you realize a large base of your structure that don't quite fit the density or fit but not quite well, then I would give it a try. And just a general suggestion, I mean, refinement has so, as, as you said, has so many options and so many pathways. Um, most of the time, it's just easier to come up with a list of plausible scenarios the limited list of plausible scenarios and just try them one by one and see which one works best because that might be the shortest path to, to the answer. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I have one follow-up please on what you exactly said and then I'll just leave that for the rest of the audience. Mm. So in this, uh, uh, what is it? In, in this reference model based, uh, yeah, reference model based um, refinement, uh, if I may say like that, so, and if we take all these options, let's say around rotamer uh, restraints, secondary structure restraints, Ram, Ramachandran restraints, for example, uh, let's say even global minimization as well, uh, and even the ATB restraints, for example. I mean, I clicked a lot of options. That's the idea uh, for these. Let's say for 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 the for the for the map at seven angstrom. 
is it not going to disrupt what has already been built uh, in my, uh, let's say, three angstrom map? Because I'm confident of what is in the three angstrom map. Really, really confident. Oh. Right. Well, seven angstrom is actually <laughs> very tricky because, I mean, it's very, very far away from atomic resolution. And, you know, you may have a philosophical question. Does it make sense to refine atomic model into such a non-atomic resolution map. So you may just be fine doing docking and rigid body requirements if you really talk about a uh, seven action resolution uh, map. Or if you choose to refine individual coordinates, you really want to um, be very constrained and restrained because again, any any individual atomic movements against this map are not going to be quite well justified because again, the seven angstrom is very very far from atomic resolution. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. So I see that uh, Val Valeria has a hand up. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the Rotamar outlier. So. I've been mostly working with structures that have the resolution worse than 3.6 angstrom. And all the time during the refinement, the Srotomer outliers would come back. So my first question is, uh, what could one do about it? Is there some kind of a setting to control that? And second, what I've been doing to fix that was just, once I'm done with the refinement, to just um, encode just the Rotomers without the main chain and we run the validation. So is that uh, an acceptable practice or not really? Hi, hey, Valeria. Uh, good question. So, um, my question for you, what version of Phoenix you are currently using? Okay, so last time I used it was a long time ago, like more than a year ago. <laughs> okay, so that, mm -hmm. that, that partially answers the question. Um, so, beginning of, this, of the year, I spent a lot of time trying to uh, significantly improve Rotomer fittings and Rotomer restraints and I think I made a good progress on this. So um, it's literally, literally it's best that you try again using the latest uh, version of Phoenix from Nitro Build, not even official, but uh, from literally Nitro Build. And that should be very much improved to the point that you don't really need to do anything manually. You don't need to tweak your parameters or anything like that. So you should be just fine. If you still have and like I said, it's kind of ongoing, so I'm still working on this, making it even better. So if you still have issues, if you still you know run and get outliers for no reason apparently, so then um, then get back um, in touch with me uh, by email and we'll look at your case and maybe we can just use your case to improve the overall procedure. So, um, but I think at this point it's just best to forget what you tried before, just try it now and, and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, get back to me and we'll make it work. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, there are some other questions coming in, but maybe we should leave those to later on so we can keep going with the, the practical part. Okay, sure. Um, well, practical part of that is very... Gonna be easy because, like I said, Phoenix real specify is very automated. So I'll just run an example, explain basics, and hope you ask questions. Okay, so I'm going to start up Phoenix. I'm going to use one of the nightly builds, not the latest. Happen to have some little bit older ones, but that should be fine for tutorial. So that's the GUI. And I kind of expect people can just watch me doing things or people can follow me, follow the tutorial. So either way, it's fine. I'm going to try to not be very fast. And if anyone... so, Pavel, is it possible to change the resolution of your display at all? To be lower resolution, that sounds crazy, but um, uh, the GUI is quite small. 
Okay. Um, we, let's see. Uh, can I go to get display options? Display. Uh, uh, it be so yeah, you can click. Hold on, I think it's even smaller. Yeah, I think that's good. Better? I think so. Okay. Um, okay, let's stick to this one. Great. Okay, so thanks, Paul, for noticing this. Um, so, yeah, uh, people can follow me along or just watch me doing stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run um, real space refinement. I'm going to run uh, some validation just to show you what's available and how, how you uh, do this. Okay, so I'm going to create a new project. So I have my path set up here. I'm going to set up tutorial. Click on set up tutorial data. I'm going to define where I'm going, I'm going to have files. By default, the market list goes to documents. Change it to where I want it to be. We can change it to where you want it to be. And tutorial data, click on select the data set. Scroll down, you'll see cry and there's a number of things here. So I'll choose MomK double helical filament. Fragment of it, not the whole thing. So I choose, so that's the search from the bottom in CryM section. I choose that one. So you can, at the same time, it's a good idea when you do tutorials uh, on your own. You, even myself, I find it useful. Uh, you click on README and that explains to you what this tutorial is about. So, uh, for example, I don't remember what the resolution is, and it tells it's about 3.6. So, anyway, so it's just to mention it's available to you. So, I say OK, and I'll set up tutorial data. Now, um, what I'm going to do first, I know that this particular example has a model that is not very well geometrically. And it's a good idea to, before you're running your plan, it's a good idea to know where you're sending it in the beginning. I'm going to run a comprehensive validation on this data model to see what the starting point is. So to do so, you can go to CryM on the right, and there's a comprehensive validation CryM. Alternatively, uh, it's the same. You can go to validation, and there's a comprehensive validation CryM. So it's the same, the same thing, just for your convenience, arranged in, in different, logically different uh, places. So we, let's, do, let's do comprehensive validation CryM first, just to see what it looks like. Click on comprehensive validation. Hopefully it should pop up prompt where you load in all the inputs and from yesterday's tutorial from Tom, I'm sure you're now familiar how things work. It's very similar generally. So um, I'm going to load in um, map and model. Or Mark, you can just do two files at once. There's pretty much nothing really to change except that you need to provide resolution. And if you don't and rise, it will complain. So we'll have to provide a resolution. So from memory, I think it's 3.6. Um, and it's going to validate model data and model to data fit. If you don't need all of them, you can just you know, choose one of the three. And we hit run. It shouldn't take a while. It should take literally on my Mac laptop takes about less than a minute, I think.
And what it's going to create is going to create a pretty comprehensive validation report about your model, how model fits the data, and the data itself. And this is something you also see after each and every real space refinement run. So this is what you get, and that's the summary, summary page. So I typically, when I do it myself in routine work, I typically, at this very point, I open things in Qt. You got a map and model in Qt. So I can readily explore them. So my default Qt always shows the tiny sphere around map. So I'll go to preferences, map parameters, and increase the map size that you see to something greater than 10 and some default values. I'm also using very old cues and maybe, and I'm pretty sure you can set up this in preferences and good preferences, so you don't have to do it, but that's a nice exercise to show you how you can do it. Okay, so yeah, more map on the screen. And okay, what, what, what do we see here? A number of things. So remember, validation is all about looking at model data and how model fits the data. So the way it's set up in, in, in here, um, we highlight things that require your attention, something that is not good. What's not good here? So for example, you got quite a lot of Roman channel plot outliers, 2.1%. And remember this 3.6, that this resolution is already expected to have any outliers. There. Um, it cannot be justified by by the by the man by the data. So I'm out of favorite. I think more probably to recommend to have more than ninety six ninety eight percent from memory. So we have ten percent lower than the threshold. Run the death score is very poor. Remember anything greater than three absolute value is poor. So Amazon is poor, a lot of rotten outliers, and so on. So you can endlessly explore uh, this table, which we don't have time to do. Um, but so you know, you can uh, click. So these items are clickable. So you can click on on particular field, and you will be brought to the proper topic. So I click on Ramachandran plot, and now we'll look at Ramachandran plot. Uh, so I didn't explain this actually, but uh, so there are actually six from a channel plots, not just one that everybody used to look at. So this is in um, painting Dave Richardson's paper. Um, so you have six different channel plots for different residue types, and the general one is the one that everybody used to look at most of the time. So these are the plots. And you can choose which one you look. So you can basically zoom in on a particular plot. So click on general, that's the, that's the general plot. So we have three outliers, um, some distribution that to my eye doesn't look great. Um, that's the list of outliers, and that's the clickable list. So you can click on outliers, they will be zoomed in Qt, they'll be centered in Qt. And that's how you explore and fix problems. So you just go one by one and and explore explore them and look at them and see uh, what you can do. Right. So going back to summary, um, that's all about model. And again, that you can spend hours just looking at all of these metrics here. Click and get focused in Qt and see how you can address them. One thing I just see right away, there is a nine, which is magnesium, and it doesn't have any density to in, in, in the big, in the input structure. So and there's a nice peak that you know it supposedly should go into. So also you see a lot of clashes, all these red dots indicate clashes, which you should avoid as good as, far as, as much as possible. Right, but we got a quick idea of what's available. And again, a lot of things to explore. There's a correlation for residue to go to model versus data. 
this is actually clickable, so you can click on you know, outliers and get get zoomed in cute and see how you can fix them if you can. Sometimes you can't, like in this case, for example. Anyways, that's how um, comprehensive validation looks like. And now we got an idea of how things look to begin with. And now let's quickly run refinement. I close down the validation tab and I'm going to go to refinement again. Uh, to do refinement in real space for Crime, you can go to refinement and there will be real space refinement tab in refinement. Alternatively, you go to Cryam, and that's exactly the same real space refinement on the Cryam. So we click on that one. Um, something I didn't mention, but it's a good idea to always specify the job title. So you know when you come back, you know what you did. So, uh, Put something meaningful that you know makes sense to you, um, so you can come back and know what you did. Um, very similar interface here. So for for refinement, remember all we need is map, model, and resolution. And remember, resolution is not used for anything but reporting cross correlations. So give map model. We specify resolution three point six. There isn't really much else to, to do here, except that you have a choice for filing prefix. You can say what you want to the output. We output MMC files by default all the time. And it's mandatory. MMC file format for the model is mandatory for deposition of uh, crystallographic practice. I don't think it's the case for Cryam, but I'm pretty sure it's coming to be the case for Cryam. So we are well prepared. We have a way to uh, produce atomic model in, models in MMC file format. Okay, so we can go to refinement settings next. That's what I typically do normally. And on the strategy, and I, I should say, actually, there are a lot of parameters related to, to, to refinement. So there's more than 100 parameters. And we have no way to show them all in one page. So if you really want to explore these parameters, we need to find a parameter, go to all parameters. And there's a way to, to find parameters that you are interested in. And if you don't really know exactly what you're looking for, but you have an idea, you can go to search parameters and for example, uh, what would be an example? Uh, for example, what if you want to turn on or off Roma channel block restraint? So I don't remember what's the keyword and there is nothing here. Actually, there is a Roma channel block restraint here, <laughs> okay. Um, but still you can find, you can just look for parameters like you can type Roma channel and you get a whole bunch of different uh, parameters related to Ramachan as well. So that's how you find parameters that you're looking for. So by default, it's defining coordinates. It's optimizing side chain runners. It does de facto refinement by default all the time. But remember I mentioned it really does matter only to do it uh, towards the end. You don't really, if you're in the middle of model building refinement, you don't really want to refine de facto, right? So I would disable it for now for this tutorial, but I recommend disabling it all the time unless you are in the final state. Then you don't waste time doing de facto refinement. Uh, there's a technical parameters, but uh, how many macrocycles? So by default, we use five macrocycles. That's, that's how, how, how hard you try to refine a structure. So it's a compromise between too few, too much. Um, if you're, again, if you're in the very beginning, you may want to increase it down up to you know, 10 or something. If you just change one residue and want to do very quick refinement, you change it to something smaller, three, one, whatever. Um, so that should do it. Um, that's really how, how much uh, effort you want to put in refinement. Um, there's a lot of 
other parameters here, um, such as again, Ramachandran restraints depends. It's really case dependent. Like I said in, before, you can turn it on and off. Um, you can make refinement faster, much faster actually, because recently I added more uh, multi-processing into real space refinement. So by default, it's going to use one processor. You can actually specify as many as you have access to, and that should make refinement faster. Okay, I'm going to run it now so it runs. And by the way, uh, we have a safeguard. Um, so remember, we don't want to fix Ramachan outliers by using restraints. So if you have a lot of outliers, it's a good idea to fix them manually and then um, and then run refinement to preserve them rather than let refinement to fix them. So in this case, we just say okay because we don't have time to fix them all manually, but that's the that's the good warning for you to actually not fix Ramachan flow outliers by means of restraints. So that should take about a minute on my laptop. Uh, and it will, per, as we specify, I will do uh, three macro cycles of coordinate refinement and um, rotomer fitting. So, um, in all cases, it will use optimal weight to do refinement, and that's where it's specified here. So, how the optimal weight is defined. So, basically, it the procedure tries many different weights until it produces the root mean square deviation from bonds and angles, library values of these numbers. So you can basically have an indirect way to change the weight, refinement weight, by changing these values. So you can make, you can put more emphasis on the data by changing this required deviations to something larger, like you can send 0.2, Say you can say two, so that will make more emphasis on the data and use more lousy restraints. So that's how you affect the refinement weight. Okay, so it prints, it's at the third macro cycle now. Um, it's almost finished. Prints a lot of output to the log. Um, try to make it as concise as possible and informative, still a lot. Basically tells you it's every macro cycle, it tells you what's the what's the correlations, what's the deviations. This is important place to look at, tells you the clash score, or mechanical outliers, favorites, and, and, and such. So um, tells you Rama Z score every macro cycle. So again, you can just follow See how that changes from macrocycle to to macrocycle, and once it's finished, it will create similar, pretty much identical validation report as we just seen running comprehensive validation on its own. Okay, it's finished now. I'll close queue that comes from validation. So um. I'll start code from refinement. So this is our refined structure. We'll make map bigger. Okay, and basically that generates um, a similar, as I said, similar validation reports as we just did running validation on its own. So expectedly, and that's good to see that there's less red lines here, there's less highlights. There are still some problems, but again, the requirement is typically not capable to fix each and every problem in general. So if we look at the model, just, you know, rotate it and just have a quick look. We see that still some clashes. If you remember the previous one, there are less clashes for sure. That's what I remember. 
we can look at that magnesium actually moved into the density peak, which is nice. And half life is coordinated by, by neighbor residues via uh, metal coordination restraints that are used uh, by default automatically. Think Nigel. So things look to be quite good. Uh, Ramachandran Z score, remember, we start out with minus four, I think, which is poor. Now we have minus 1.7, <clears throat> which is less than two, which is considered as good. We got a better Ramachandran plot. We can actually look at it going to model property. Lots of tabs here that maybe Jane talked about in greater details. So I can click on Ramachandran and don't have outliers and just visually to look at the main one kind of uh, fit the, the the distributions there are more things to explore obviously so you can go to and look at covalent geometry it's all clickable and just to tell i'm showing what's available i'm not going to tell go to the, the entire procedure but the thing is basically the idea is you go to each and every tab after refining, look for highlights, look for problems, fix them in code, do as good as possible job, save your structure, go to the next round of refinement. That's the idea. And you can recover previous jobs and look at what you had before. I don't know if somebody at this point how you cover the job but I can close down the refinement tab here and can go back for example to validation that we had um, a few minutes ago go to job history validation crime restore the job and that's that's what we start out started out with can open it and could so that all the history is preserved, so you can go back and forth and see what was the starting point, what you used to have, and remember. Uh, so refinement definitely produced much less clashes that we, we had in the beginning, but some clashes may require manual uh, rebuilding to, to fix them. Okay, so I'm definitely out of time right now, so I'll finish right here and I'll do my best to answer the questions. Great, thank you, Pavel. So, um, there's a couple of questions, uh, there's a bunch more questions that did get answered, but there's a couple that I wanted to go back to. Um, so, uh, Ibrahim said, uh, in refining a costahedral structure, so I guess a virus, cutting out the map around a monomer is never perfect. And because of that, side chains invade neighboring density during refinement and require manual correction after every cycle. Any tips to help with this? Yes. Um, so you may want to, when you cut out a box around, around the chain or whatever you select to be in the box, I think by default, that <coughs> box is not going to be a must out. So you basically, when you cut out the box, you have an option to mask out everything that is not covered by, by the model. And so that may just set all the density values to zero or something very small values outside your molecular region. So the side chains not going to wander into, into, into neighboring densities. So this is one way of doing this. And I think that's the only way of doing this at this point. Yeah, and there's, a, there's an additional, uh, also refining the whole structure always reports a lot of clashes. Uh, this is at 2.4 angstrom resolution. Any suggestion on refinement strategy in that case? Too many clashes. Um, it depends. Um, so it's really case by case. So if you have a lot of uh, symmetry, it depends on the previous history. So whether you just define one, one chain and then came back to the whole thing. In that case, you may in, want to increase number of uh, refinement microcycles from default five to, um, 
I don't know, to 15, for example, and let cat model settle. Another strategy would be to do simulated annealing because that will shake up the structure and let it explore more, more conformational states and more density in general. So that may help. Um, but I think a combination of uh, simulated annealing and um, more microcycles should do it. Yeah, maybe I could also say it's worth uh, checking the magnification of the map. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, a large virus particle, if the magnification is off, even by a relatively small amount, that will have a significant impact on the, the model, potentially. Right. Uh, also, you can make, just for, for the time being, for the, for the one run, you can make restraints where it's strong. So things that get pushed apart a lot in the very first defining climate run. And then you go back to softer restraints, and that, that, that sometimes helps. But it's not thing to try, yeah. So one thing you really should do is look at the model in the map and see where the clashes are. If they're all around the edges, then you know what to do. If they're particular local places, you should go and fix them. Not just refine them, but actually try a different um, possibilities there. Anyway, you certainly want to look at the clashes before you decide which uh, strategy to use. Yes, that's a great point. Um, Absolutely. Jane, yeah. It's a uh, yeah. I mean, uh, ho hopefully, it's understood in all of this that looking at the map and the model is really important, <laughs> and there is no. Uh, we, we we appreciate that the models and maps can be very large, but there is no alternative really to looking. And that that's maybe the price you pay for looking working on some very large exciting structure is you've got a lot of it to look at. Right. So yeah, refinement is really local optimization. So it can move atoms a little bit locally, but it's not going to jump over energy big energy barriers. Um, I mean, at least with the default settings. So yes, so there is no substitute for manual looking and fixing the model when needed. Um, there was another question here, and, and we should move on to Nigel, but just to get to this question, uh, I got a symmetric map from Relyon with C4 symmetry and refined my model in Phoenix with NCS check, but the model out is still not exactly fourfold symmetric. Okay, yeah, that, that's a very typical question. Uh, well, number one, this is this is improved in latest site levels of Phoenix. So if you don't, if you use this, if you use refinement in in older versions, try latest. Otherwise, make sure that NCS constraints were actually used in this case. So the log file should tell what um, what chains were NCS constrained and make sure that matches your expectation. So if it doesn't, you need to specify them manually. You just need to create a parameter file or go and do it in the GUI to define what exactly is NCS related. And then that will be enforced. So that's the most common reason for not obeying symmetry. So somebody runs refinement and believes, okay, NCS are enabled. Hopefully that, you know, that, that happens. But if model is not perfectly symmetric to begin with, then refinement may not pick up on NCS right away. And then, um, then you need to do it manually. That's, that's the major suggestion. And I think if you do it manually and if you absolutely make sure NCS constraints are defined and groups are uh, those that you want to be, then that should be perfect. And if it's still not the case, get back to me and I'll make it the case. Okay, great. Thanks, Pavel. And, and thanks for the great questions, everyone. Let's move on to, and, and there's been a couple of questions about restraints actually um, during the talk. Uh, let's move on to Nigel who talk about restraints. 